On September 14, 1974, two people were off-roading when they found human remains belonging to a male on the side of a trail in Aliso Viejo, California. The man appeared to have lost his life a few days before being found. The incident was initially ruled accidental due to alcohol and diazepam intoxication. In 1980, investigators found other deceased men that lost their lives due to alcohol and diazepam intoxication. They noticed a pattern and believed foul play could be involved. Confirming their beliefs, over the years, the bodies of multiple young men were found throughout Southern California. Some of them were found near where the 1974 John Doe's remains were located. In May 1983, Randy Stephen Kraft, later known as the Scorecard Slayer, was arrested for taking the life of a California Highway Patrol officer conducting a traffic stop on Kraft. There was a body belonging to a male victim, later identified as Terry Lee Gambrell, in the front seat. There were several empty beer bottles and an open prescription bottle of lorazepam tablets at his feet. In the trunk of Kraft's vehicle was a coded list of his likely over 67 victims. In May 1989, Kraft was convicted. Now 78 years old, he remains incarcerated at San Quentin State Prison. The 1974 John Doe has long been thought to be an early victim of Kraft, but for so long he remained unidentified. Despite attempts to establish the victim's identity, he was interred at El Toro Memorial Park in an unmarked grave. In November 2022, investigators began using genetic genealogy to try to identify John Doe and eventually found relatives in October 2023. The victim was identified as 17-year-old Michael Ray Schlicht of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. The teenager loved warm weather, according to his family, and was known to hitchhike. His family members requested privacy and planned to install a headstone to mark his final resting place. Investigators with the Orange County Sheriff's Department explained that they enlisted the help of Othram Laboratories in 2022. They developed a DNA profile based on the victim's tissue samples and were able to identify his possible grandparents. That couple's granddaughter told investigators she had not seen her 17-year-old brother Michael since April 1974. Investigators received a DNA sample from a woman believed to be John Doe's mother, which positively identified the victim as Michael Schlicht. Even though it is believed that Randy Stephen Kraft took Michael's life, police continued to investigate the case. Anyone with information related to this case is encouraged to contact Orange County Crime Stoppers at 1-855-TIP-OCCS or crimestoppers.org. Natalie Cochran, a licensed pharmacist, originally hails from West Virginia, a state known for its stunning natural beauty and tight-knit communities. She carved a place for herself there, living a seemingly ordinary life with her husband, Michael Cochran. Natalie and Michael seem to be enjoying a life of tranquility, but that peaceful existence was abruptly shattered when Michael suddenly and mysteriously passed away on February 11, 2019. Later that same year, Natalie was thrust into the spotlight due to the unraveling of a Ponzi scheme and mounting allegations that suggested her involvement in her husband's demise might be deeper and more sinister than initially believed. In July 2019, federal prosecutors filed a civil lawsuit against Natalie Cochran, 
alleging that she and her late husband, Michael, operated a financial scam. The Cochrans were the owners of two companies, Tactical Solutions Group and Technological Management Studios. They purportedly led investors to believe that Tactical held government contracts to supply semi-automatic weapons to various defense agencies, including the U.S. Department of Defense. These allegations marked the start of a complex legal saga. According to the civil lawsuit, the Cochrans deceived investors by making them believe in the legitimacy of their government contracts. In total, both companies raised at least $2.5 million from 11 investors. Investors were promised significant returns on their investments, but the truth was vastly different. U.S. Attorney Mike Stewart revealed that Tactical did not possess any government contracts for semi-automatic weapons. Instead, the Cochrans allegedly spent investors' money on lavish living, expensive dining, and other personal expenses. Tactical made donations to various local organizations, including Shady Spring Middle School's football department and the Shady Spring Youth Baseball League. They also donated semi-automatic weapons as bingo prizes at a fundraiser held at Shady Spring High School. This fundraiser raised over $32,000, with half of the proceeds going to Shady Spring High Volleyball and the other half to the Shady Spring Youth Baseball League, for which Natalie served as treasurer. Despite the significant donations, questions began to emerge about the legitimacy of the funds. The league board member, James Quesenberry, revealed that Tactical's check for $16,680 bounced, and numerous unauthorized withdrawals were made from the league account. An internal audit was conducted to investigate financial records. As the legal scrutiny intensified, Natalie filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy in July. Her bankruptcy filings revealed that she had minimal income and assets. She claimed to have less than $600 in bank accounts and a staggering $1.4 million in liabilities. The allegations against the Cochrans prompted federal and state investigations into their business dealings. It was reported that investors received letters on a U.S. Department of Defense letterhead, assuring them that their returns on investment would be available at a later date. Natalie maintained that much of the information related to the investments was classified and could not be discussed. Natalie claimed in a creditor's meeting that federal agents and West Virginia State Police had frozen her bank accounts rendering her unable to pay her creditors. On February 11, 2019, Natalie's husband and business partner, Michael Cochran, passed away at Bowers Hospice House, five days after supposedly hitting his head during a seizure. The circumstances surrounding Michael's end prompted authorities to investigate further. Reports emerged that Michael had been hospitalized multiple times in the months preceding due to an unspecified illness. A government official in Raleigh County disclosed that West Virginia State Police were looking into the case. In a startling development, a judicial order was executed in early September, leading to the exhumation of Michael Cochran's body from Sunset Memorial Gardens. The copy of the judicial order was reportedly sealed, pending the close of both federal and state investigations into the circumstances surrounding his tragic fate. Natalie maintained that her husband's passing was a result of an accidental fall that caused him to hit his head during a seizure. She asserted that Michael was transported to the hospital 20 minutes after his fall, and denied any involvement in what had happened to him. However, 
there were conflicting reports regarding the timeline of events and the presence of other adults in the house during the critical hours preceding Michael's hospitalization. In November 2021, Natalie found herself facing a first-degree charge for taking the life of her husband. By then, Natalie was already serving an 11-year federal prison sentence related to the Ponzi scheme, which further fueled speculation about her involvement in Michael's end. The proceedings took an unexpected turn during a hearing in a Raleigh County courtroom. Natalie appeared in the courtroom wearing a brown skirt, khaki-colored pants, and shackles on her hands. Members of her family, including her two teenage children, were present. In a surprising move, the prosecution decided to drop the charge against Natalie. The reason cited was the need for more time to gather evidence. The prosecution's decision was a strategic one, aimed at allowing for a re-examination of Michael's body. Raleigh County Prosecuting Attorney Ben Hatfield made the motion to dismiss the charge, stating how vital the re-examining of the body would be to the case. Hatfield further clarified that he had consulted Michael's family before formally requesting the exhumation. The decision to re-exhume the body was not taken lightly, as Hatfield sought an expert's opinion to ensure that the examination would yield viable scientific evidence. Hatfield's request was rooted in the need for a specialized test that could detect insulin levels in tissue samples. This test had not been conducted during the initial autopsy, which took place when Michael's body was first exhumed in September 2019. The absence of this specific test left room for uncertainty. According to Hatfield, it was extremely likely that he would re-indict Natalie for the slaying of her husband once the examination was complete. Natalie's defense attorneys did not object to the prosecution's motions, which raised curiosity about their strategy. Matthew Victor, one of Cochrane's attorneys, revealed that this move would provide them with an opportunity to gather more evidence from the federal investigation. Their aim was to prove that Michael was aware of the Ponzi scheme, a revelation that, if true, could significantly impact the state's case. Despite the charge being dropped, Natalie still had several more years to serve in her federal sentence. This fact weighed into the decision to dismiss the charge. The goal was to conduct the necessary tests and gather more evidence while she served her federal sentence. Following the hearing, as she was escorted out of the courtroom by police, Natalie had a brief moment to speak with her family. In a poignant exchange, she expressed her love and bid farewell to her children. The parents of Michael Cochran were also present during the hearing. The latest development in the case of Natalie Cochran happened on October 24, 2023, when Raleigh County Prosecuting Attorney Ben Hatfield announced that a special grand jury had re-indicted Natalie and charged her with taking Michael's life. After the body was exhumed, a renowned forensic pathologist from Texas confirmed that someone had taken Michael's life, attributing it to the unprescribed exogenous insulin in Michael's system. Due to the special grand jury session being so late in its term, it is expected that Natalie Cochran will go to trial in 2024, where it is expected that she will be found guilty of all the charges against her. In June and July of 1984, four separate women were violated and assaulted by one man in Connecticut. The four victims were never publicly named and only became known as Jane Doe 1, 2, 3, and 4. 
All four victims reported being blindfolded and assaulted inside their homes by an unidentified assailant. All of them reported their attacker rummaging through their personal belongings, eating food from their refrigerators, and leaving faucets running. Investigators linked the four crimes because the DNA collected at the crime scenes belonging to the suspect showed that only one man was responsible. Unfortunately, DNA was not advanced enough back in 1984 to identify this unknown assailant. The crimes took place in Windsor, Bloomfield, Middletown, and Rocky Hill, Connecticut. Over the years, leads dried up or failed to materialize as detectives tirelessly hunted down any clues as to who could have been behind the crimes. Investigators caught a break in 2020 when DNA technology implicated Michael Sharp in the cold cases. DNA evidence collected from crime scenes, including linens, laundry clothes, and towels ultimately matched Sharp and tied him to the crime scenes. DNA recovered from his trash by investigators proved that he was indeed responsible. In November of 2020, 69-year-old Michael Marion Sharp of Marlboro, Connecticut was arrested. With this arrest, the victims of these crimes who have waited more than three decades to see their attacker brought to justice now know he will be held accountable for his crimes, Chief State's Attorney Richard Colangelo said in a statement. Turning to forensic genetic genealogy as a possible breakthrough for unsolved cases shows that the cold case unit's investigators never forget the victims of these crimes. Supervisory Assistant State's Attorney John F. Fahey, head of the cold case unit, said in a statement after Sharp was arrested. Sharp was once a chief executive officer of a group that ran the Jamoki Academy, a tuition-free charter school in Hartford. Sharp's trial began in November of 2022 in the Hartford Superior Court. Three of the women were in the courtroom, while the fourth took part via video conference. All four testified about being attacked in their bedrooms in the middle of the night, and how they suffered lifelong trauma. Relatives of Sharp also testified and asked Judge Frank Diadabo for leniency. Police said they were led to Sharp in 2020, because his relatives had given DNA samples to the GED Match website. DNA samples taken from trash outside Sharp's home and later from his cheeks matched the DNA found at the crime scenes. Forensic experts told the jury that there was a 1 in 7 billion chance that the DNA belonged to somebody else other than Sharp. The first victim, a 25-year-old woman living at an apartment in Bloomfield, reported she'd been burglarized and assaulted by a male perpetrator on June 3rd of 1984. She told law enforcement she'd been sleeping in her bedroom when Sharp entered her dwelling. The intruder placed his hand over my mouth and told me not to scream or he would shoot me and my roommate. Sharp was convicted on all eight kidnapping charges that had been brought against him after a five-day trial, where a state jury in Hartford deliberated for less than one hour before delivering their unanimous verdict. He could not be charged with assault because there was a five-year statute of limitations at the time. Kidnapping charges, though, have no such limit. Sharp then apologized to the women, but he said that he has memory problems and had no recollection of the crimes. I don't know what happened. I don't know. But I'm so sorry, he said. You deserve so much better. No one should ever come into your home and violate you. If I was this person, if I was this monster, I hope that he is dead inside of me after that two months of my life. On January 9th of 2023, 71-year-old Sharp received a 72-year sentence for his role. Judge Frank M. Diadabo, who handed down the sentence in a Hartford courtroom, imposed a minimum of 40 years behind bars. The judge compared the pain Sharp's victims endured to lifelong sentences. The four women would forever be haunted by the agonizing trauma he inflicted. The judge described Sharp as a predator. You fit that definition, said the judge in court, a person who ruthlessly exploits others. 
Today's sentencing shows that years of hard work and collaboration among multiple agencies in the pursuit of justice can finally lead to a successful result, Chief State's Attorney Patrick Griffin said. The investigators and prosecutors in the cold case unit never give up on these difficult cases and look to the latest advances in forensic science and other technologies to help solve them. Our hope is that this prison sentence brings some measure of peace to all the brave women who testified at the trial. Sharp had this to say after the sentencing. I just don't know how I could have possibly done something so monstrous, Sharp told his victims. Sharp had indicated he'd vowed to leave it up to the jury to determine whether I'm this monster. And they said I was, Sharp added. And so I'm going to have to live by that. Forty-five-year-old Michael C. Schumeister lived in St. Petersburg, Florida. On the evening of August 14th of 1997, Michael's body was found outside of Mirror Lake Library, roughly half a mile from his home. He was lying on his back, and his pockets had been turned inside out. Investigators later learned that he had been paid and cashed his check earlier that same day, hinting heavily at robbery as being the motive. The medical examiner's report determined that Michael suffered blunt force trauma to the head and neck. Patricia Morris, who was 47 years old at the time, was identified as a person of interest early on. Investigators learned that Michael and Morris were drinking together at a bar the evening before. Morris later spoke with a detective and confirmed that she and Michael had been drinking together and that they both left in a taxi together. But, she told police the two eventually parted ways and both were dropped off at separate places by the taxi driver later that night. Morris passed away on September 19th of 2010 in Hillsborough County, Florida. Then, in 2016, investigators took another look into the case, finding that Morris had an extensive criminal history, including battery on law enforcement officers and various drug charges. In late March of 2022, the St. Petersburg Police Department Cold Case Unit took Michael Schumeister's pants out of property and evidence storage and tested the reversed pockets at the Pinellas County Forensics Lab for DNA re-evaluation. On November 2nd of 2022, detectives received a response from the combined DNA index system, CODIS, that the DNA found on the inside of the front and rear pants pocket belonged to Patricia Morris. The St. Petersburg Police Department said in a November 18, 2022 press release that the case is now considered closed since the offender is no longer alive. Our cold case detectives dedicate their time and experience to taking a fresh look at unsolved cases, the St. Petersburg Police Department said. With advances in technology and new information, they can bring justice for victims and closure to their families. Based on the recent DNA evidence and prior investigations, this case is now considered closed with the offender not being alive. Michael Schumeister's family members have been informed that the case has been closed. Six-year-old Michael Glover lived in Macon, Georgia in 2004. He was a pastor and was well known in the community. On March 29th, he was fatally shot in the carport of his West Macon home. People in the community were shocked as he was so beloved. Investigators collected DNA from the suspect at the crime and stored it to be used later. For Michael's family, it was a long wait. His father, Willie Glover, described Michael as special and unique and would give the shirt off his back to help anyone. We were a close-knit family. We got together, and he was missing. Finally, in 2021, his family would receive some good news. In March of 2021, 39-year-old Terrence Dean of Macon was arrested. It was discovered that his DNA matched the DNA found at the crime scene back in 2004, as well as DNA found on an assault case. Investigator Malcolm Bryant with the Bibb County Sheriff's Office had this to say. The investigators that started the case, they did a good job in regards to including the small details which was very important. Taking that into consideration, 
I felt that there was a great chance that this case would lead to an arrest. Technology is nowhere near where it was back in 2004, which is a great thing for us. I think that is the direction that law enforcement is taking in general, towards the technology area. He believes they will be able to solve many more cases in the near future. Terrence Dean is currently being held without bond at this time. The motive has not been made public.